I'm John Cornelius, and this is Surviving Shelter in Place for Families. Who am I? I am a medical doctor and a psychoanalyst, and I've worked in the field of mental health for the last 20 years. I spend a lot of time working with individuals and families in an intensive way. I'm an instructor at the University of California, Davis, in their Department of Psychiatry, where I teach psychoanalysis. Importantly for this talk, I've been married for the last 19 years, and we have two boys aged 10 and 13. And so my contribution here is to really recognize that shelter in place is hard on families, and it has come as a shock to many of them. Not only is the coronavirus really scary, but shelter in place has really changed the family environment for most families. There's no soccer, there's no clubs, there's no friends coming over, they're not going out and doing activities all the time. And instead, there's a huge amount of time that families are spending together without the breaks that they're used to. There's no easy escape routes, and many of the avenues that we've had to deal with stress are closed right now. What I really want to do in this talk is develop three concepts that should help families cope. The first one is, is dysregulation and repair is normal. The second one is to talk about good enough versus perfect parenting. And the third one is to discuss this idea of open dialogue versus managing uh, situations that occur in families. Let me start with a story, a real experience I had during my training. There were these two psychiatric hospitals in the Sacramento area, and they both got patients from the same pool of patients. So patients would be in distress and either their insurance or they would go to an emergency room, but basically they just sort of got routed to one hospital or the other. So the populations in both these hospitals was relatively the same. Now, one thing I did, and many other doctors in training did, is they work at these hospitals at night. They take call, which is when an emergency happens, they get called in, and they sort of have to deal with the emergent crisis that's happening in these hospitals. Interestingly, there was a huge difference in these two hospitals. So I actually worked at this hospital, Hospital B, but I had a lot of friends and colleagues who worked at Hospital A. And at Hospital A, it was remarkable. They were getting called in two, three, four, even five times a night for emergencies. And so there would be these disruptions that would happen in the hospital. People would be upset, they would be hurting, they would be sad, but there'd be these big disruptions that would happen in the hospital and it would result in these sort of emergency situations happening where they would call in the staff. You know, in hospital A, they sort of dealt with it, sort of looking at it as a behavioral model, behavioral disruptions, they would sort of deal with it behaviorally and they'd really try to get those people to sort of follow the rules and go along with the program. However, it tended to end up with an increased use of medications, increased use of, you know, forced medications where people would actually get shots because they did not want to take the medications, but they were so disruptive and things were going so wrong that you would have to either put the person in restraints or they'd have to take a forced medication. It was really hard. It was a, it was a hard place to work. Now, Hospital B, rather than the doctors getting called in, you know, three times a night. When I worked for this hospital, I think I got called in three or four times in the entire year. Hugely different outcome. And again, we're talking about the same patients. And so I actually ended up working at this hospital. So I actually saw what was happening during the day too. And what I saw was that, you know what? People were still quite upset. People were in a lot of distress. They were upset. There would be, you know, shouting and all these other things was still happening here. But the difference is how it was dealt with. And, you know, to give a good example, I was at the hospital one day and I saw a patient who was extremely upset, yelling and screaming, and a very difficult situation was sort of brewing. But what this nurse did is the nurse went up to the patient and just said, look, it really seems like you're having a dis difficult time. Why don't you tell me about it? And what she did is rather than pull for medications, she went and got a cup of tea. And she said, come sit with me. Let's talk about what's going on. Let's talk about how much distress you're in. And let's try to just be helpful. I I'm here. I want to listen. And it led to peace. And so there's this big difference between Hospital A and Hospital B. 
And I'll put forward, people were happier in this hospital. You know, in this hospital, doctors even started to become anxious about working here because they said like, wow, there's so many bad outcomes. I'm a little worried I'm going to get sued. I'm a little not comfortable with what's happening here. I'll also put forward, it's not so different than what we see in households. I think we can all say that we'd much rather be living in house B than in house A. So let's go on and talk about family systems. I think we all know that they thrive on love. Okay, it's, this is pretty straightforward. Whatever kind of family you have, they thrive on love. But another thing that is just true is that there's dysregulation in families. It just happens. And in fact, dysregulation is normal. It is part of what just happens in families. However, by itself, if dysregulation is just sitting there and it just sort of happens and there's no way of dealing with it, the dysregulation actually grows and grows and grows, okay? It can just overwhelm a family. Now, dysregulation can take a whole bunch of different forms. Uh, you know, basically there's these sort of external forms which are sort of explosive and externally focused where there's this repetitive pattern of outbursts and fighting and yelling and screaming and that kind of thing. However, just as prevalent are sort of quiet dysregulations where people and individuals in the family are withdrawing. Sometimes they're just sort of disappearing even though they're present, physically present. They're sort of mentally absent. And one common form of this is addictions. One thing I'm seeing right now is a lot of news addictions where people are just sort of staring at their screens watching news for hours and hours and hours and hours, which is not really helpful for anyone. You know, it's also really important to realize that it's at this level where families and family members really do often need help to get out of a problem that's grown this large. And so it's really important for people to recognize when this is happening and that it's okay to get help when things are out of control and at this level. And this is a serious question that people really need to ask themselves on a daily basis, but the good news is, is you can get help and it can deal with these. And even in shelter in place, there's more therapists and providers of mental health that are working online and so you can get the help that you need. So while dysregulation is normal, something has to happen. And this is called repair. So a functioning family has ongoing dysregulation. It's just what happens in healthy families. And then there's repair. And so the family is constantly engaged in repair as well. And this cycle just happens and happens and happens. And when there's a good cycle of dysregulation and repair, what happens is the family grows stronger. They learn about their members. They learn about how they tick. They have a deeper understanding of what's going on in the family. And it is really good. You know, there's a famous person in our field, Wilfred Bion, who basically said the only thing we can expect from people at their best is that they can learn from experience. A lot of times we can't control these things from happening, but what we can control is that we can be in a state where we can learn from them and not let them happen over and over and over again. So that's really what we're going for. So one of the places where we first learn about this and doctors first learned about this was by studying infants and caregivers. Now, this is the way many, many researchers understand what happens. It's in the attachment literature. You can go look it up if you'd want. Um, but basically, we have these infants, right? And you have these caregivers, and we're sort of saying they're pretty good caregivers. And the infant gets upset. Like, let's say the infant is hungry. The infant doesn't know that they're hungry, right? They have an experience of pain. Something is going on inside of me. I don't like it. This is bad. This is signaling, you know, something uncomfortable inside of me. And then they have this experience in their mind of badness, right, or something. And then they cry, which is a way of communicating what's going on inside of them. Good enough caretaker usually at first resonates with it. You'll see this with good moms and dads who sort of the first thing they do is they go up to the infant and go like, wow, you look upset. And they sort of have a concerned look on their face. They're really sort of resonating with what the infant is going through. And then they go through this process of basically thinking. Okay, so they sort of reflect on what's going on. They'll sort of run through some scenarios. Gee, is the diaper full? Uh, did they sleep okay? Did they get their nap? You know, do they have a fever? All these things. And they're sort of thinking about it. And they're sort of representing things in their minds until they finally sort of 
think like, oh, maybe the infant's hungry and then they'll feed the infant and then this feeling will go away inside of the infant. But importantly, the sensation in the mind will also go away as they sort of take care of this, okay? And now, instead of having this distress, the infant, not only is the distress gone, is the infant also learns something. Like through this cycle, when it happens again and again, the infant learns, oh, I'm hungry. That's what that feeling is. So now I start to know that when I have this sensation, there's something that can be done. But they also start to learn like, oh, I can go through this process and I can get my needs met. Oh, I could be safe with this in this situation. I can even learn how to think. And it's really how infants begin to understand their own minds and their own selves. It's really important. So one example of this is the still face experiment. Dr. Edward Tronick uh, did a lot of studies regarding the still face experiment. You can see it on YouTube. You know, it's actually a pretty difficult thing to watch, but it really informs us about this connection between infants and caregivers. So what they do is they start out with the, in this case, a mom, working with her infant, and you see that they're sort of tuned in with each other. You can see them even having similar facial expressions, right? And so the mom is sort of doing all the mom things that you do with an infant, which is sort of attuned thinking, processing, understanding, maintaining attention. And then what they do is they have the mom all of a sudden just stop responding. She has a still face. And what you see happening almost immediately is a breakdown. The infant gets very upset. And in a matter of 30 seconds a minute, you'll see like the infant get more and more upset. They'll even lose their posture. They just become incoherently upset. It's actually quite hard to watch. And this is only within a few minutes. Okay, a couple few minutes. And then the mother goes back to engaging and the infant is sort of recovers. But it sort of speaks to how important it is to have a good connection between the two. So there is this really famous pediatrician, Dr. Donald Winnicott, who really wanted to underscore this relationship. And he went so far as to say, there is no such thing as an infant. He's like, don't even tell me about an infant. I don't want to know anything about an infant. What I really want to know about is infants with their caretakers. Or for him, what he said in the quote is infants with maternal care. I don't even think about one of these by themselves. I only think about them together as a single unit. And that is how you understand this relationship. So let me talk a little bit about this idea of perfect caretaking. Now, parents carry around an experience of perfect caretaking and, you know, like, oh, we're supposed to know exactly what's going to happen. We're supposed to, you know, no one's ever supposed to be up upset. If anyone's upset, it means something, you know, horrendous happened. And that is just not right. In fact, Donald Winnicott even went so far as to say, you know, if you had a perfect caretaker, it would be a disaster because the infant sort of had this experience of badness, you know, like when they're hungry, the infant actually needs to have that experience of, oh, I'm hungry, because it sort of starts a process where the infant can learn. So if you had a perfect caretaker, the infant would never even have the experience of being hungry, and it would be a disaster because they would feed them before they knew that they were hungry themselves, before they had the physical experience of it. And that's actually bad. You don't want to starve an infant in a terrible way, but you actually need the infant to have the experience of hunger and go through this process with a mom so the infant can learn about how their body and mind works. So instead, Donald Winnicott came up with this idea of a good enough caretaking or a good enough parent or a good enough mother or a good enough father. And what the good enough idea is, is really good enough. Okay. It's like magic and it's really helpful to parents to know this. I depend on this a lot when I'm spending time with my kids. I've blown it. I, it happens all the time, every day, multiple times a day. I've blown it, and then I can tell myself, okay, I was not perfect. Now I'm shooting for good enough. Let's see what I can do. And just like you'd expect with good enough, there's a range here, right? There's 
too little. So like, let's say I'm paying too little attention, bad. Now the flip side is, is if I'm paying too much attention, that's also bad. You're always looking for this sort of good enough range here. And the good enough range moves. So the good enough range is very different for infants than for toddlers, than for young children. So for uh, very young infants, right, the mother is very attentive to the idea of hunger and supplying food relatively quickly. You know, for my 10-year-old now, my 10-year-old shows up and says, I'm hungry. And we say, you know where the food is. You know, if you want to have a healthy snack, go for it. It's a very different expectation that is developmentally appropriate. And so we're always looking for this good enough range. In addition to this idea of an infant with a caretaker that was developed by Donald Winnicott, other theoreticians like Gregory Bateson and Murray Bowen studied families and they really noticed that the same idea that holds for an infant with a parent, a good enough parent, really applies to an entire family system and then we have a good enough family system. So let me tell you some exciting research that's recently come out about how tight and how important these kinds of relationships are. And I'm gonna talk briefly about a concept called entrainment. And I think we all have heard the term brain waves, but I think it's an area that is sort of emerging as being more and more important. So brain waves are waves of energy that pass through the brain and actually can be measured in lots of different ways. It's happening on a very, very small cellular level within different cells in a region of the brain, but there's also this idea that they actually work through the entire brain system to coordinate basic things like thoughts and feelings and emotions and complex thinking. It's really exciting, it's a really big deal. Okay, like this is how we think. And entrainment is the idea of organizing the way your brain thinks. So for example, if you're in a creative place, your hippocampus starts out to starts to send out these theta rhythms. And the theta rhythms, they think, is how people generate memories and have creative thoughts. And it's really important. And these theta rhythms go over the entire brain to help organize the entire brain to sort of store memories. Now, the important thing here is that they've also noticed that entrainment doesn't just happen within a single brain, it happens between brains. So for example, if you have people in the right environment and you have a speaker and a listener, you can actually get their brain waves to synchronize. It's pretty incredible. So your brain waves in one person synchronizes to the brain waves of another. Like, incredible. Now, for example, here's a recent study from 2016 or 2017 that talked about brain-to-brain -brain entrainment while one person is speaking and listening. And what they had one what they did is they had one person telling a story and the other person listening and they kind of went back and forth. And when they did this very quickly, the brains were in sync. This research is still in its infancy, but I think we can see the implications of how important it is in certain times to have your brain waves be synchronized. So one study showed that when people are engaged in a cooperative game, such as like Jenga, that these individuals who are all playing the game but are playing cooperatively, their brain waves actually synchronize. Similarly, when two guitar players are playing a duet, even if they're not playing the same music, because they're playing a duet, which is sort of two different parts of the music, their brains also will synchronize. It's a fundamental part of cooperative engagement. Now, this study was really interesting in that it had two teams. North and South was on the same team, and East and West uh, was on the same team. And what they noticed was a difference in brain waves between the two groups, as in the North and South, they synchronized, right? East and West synchronized. But when you're in an antagonistic environment, the synchronization doesn't happen between everyone. It's really interesting and has huge implications for families. So we have these good enough caretakers, we have children, and the question is, 
how do we think about this? Two basic ways of understanding how caretakers sort of function. The first one is, is object parents. And that's sort of like the concrete person. It's sort of what we concretely say, the words we say, the thoughts we say, the actions we engage in, what these behaviors mean, the actual concrete rules that we say. That's really important for parenting and engaging in families. However, just as important, and sometimes even more important, the environment of care or the environmental caretakers. And the environmental caretaking is really what happens in the background. It's sort of invisible. Uh, it's, it's our posture, our attitude, our attention, our tone, how reliable are we, how receptive are we. You know, if we think about having a boss, for example, and one boss is easygoing, understanding, reasonable, you know, all his workers underneath him will have a certain kind of experience of that boss. Now, similarly, if the boss is, you know, uptight, rule-bound, critical, angry, the group will have a different feeling. And that sort of starts to get at this environment of care that is also so important. So let's look at a family system an example. This is a personal example from my own life. It is from an event that happened before shelter in place, but I think it really sort of simply spells out what we're talking about when we think about things from a family systems example. And it was at a holiday party. It was at our house. My wife and I were hanging out with the adults and the kids, I think, were in a room watching a holiday show. All of a sudden, my older son's friends and my older son himself kind of stream out of the room crying and very upset. And they tell us, what has happened, which is that my younger son had punched them. Wow, that's really serious. A uh, younger son is, starts to punch the older kids. That sounds really bad. You know, and if we sort of silo him and only look at him out of context, you know, we might start to ask questions like, wow, does he have an impulse control disorder? Wow, maybe he, you know, needs to have Depakote, a medication to try to treat his impulse control problems. You know, maybe he has an organic brain abnormality that, you know, would be doom him to a life of impulse control problems. Similarly, some other psychiatrists might say, wow, maybe he has a ADHD, you know, a hyperactivity disorder, and that's why he punched them. You know, he can't control his impulses, so maybe we need to start him on a stimulant. And I'll just tell you, I see this all the time. This is something that no joke happens all the time and you sort of take that one member out of context and you sort of start pathologizing what's going on for them they can very quickly end up on medications that they end up taking for the rest of their lives let's continue on with the story this son did punch the older kids and the other older kids came storming out of the room however after listening to the story a little bit it became pretty clear that my older son and his friends had been teasing my younger son. And in addition, they hadn't really been listening to my younger son and that this had been going on for a while. So I guess we could then say like, wow, does my older son have an impulse control disorder? Does he have ADHD? Maybe he has antisocial personality disorder, the beginnings of the antisocial personality sort of complex. Oh my gosh, we better medicate him, right? Now, let me take this a little farther because as we start to talk, my son then reminds me, hey dad, you know, 20 minutes ago, I came and got you and I was asking you for your help. And all of a sudden it clicks in my mind. Oh yeah, I remember that. I forgot to go in and see what was going on. You did say that. And then I think about how stressed I was at that particular party. Now, it's a fun party. I like the people who are there. But just being in an environment where there are so many different people stresses me out. I enjoy the party on one hand. On the other hand, I'm somewhat stressed out. And I'm trying to make sure everyone's happy. And that's really great. But I think in the stress, I didn't pay attention. So I forgot, 
You know, so similarly, if we just look at me, we could say, wow, I'm really forgetful. You know, maybe I have dementia. Maybe I have, you know, maybe I drank too much alcohol, so I'm an alcoholic. Maybe a lot of things. But let's continue the story here because in addition, my wife's participation is that she... I actually think really likes these kinds of parties a lot more than I do. She does a great job, but she, during these parties, she is also very visitor focused. She very much wants to make sure everyone has a a good time. She's usually keeping track of visitors, but, you know, during these times doesn't keep as good a track of what's going on for the family members. And so this sort of happened. So now I think we can point out that rather than sort of scapegoating one individual family member, we can start to recognize that this is actually an event that is a family breakdown. Now, I do think that there is a time and a place for things like individuals within a family going in and getting individualized treatment. However, I think there are equally as many times where what's going on is really a family systems problem, and that by looking at the family systems problem, issue and looking at things as a breakdown within a family oftentimes can prevent the need for individuals needing treatment or medications or diagnoses, things that can really cause people lifetimes worth of struggles down the road and that can be prevented by looking at it from a family systems perspective. One way to deal with this, and I gave examples of this, is what I will call management. So management is sort of like trying to drop the hammer on one individual. So we'll sort of say, you know, my youngest son, wow, we need to set up a rule that you never punch anybody ever again. Okay, you're never going to punch anybody, right? We're going to create a behavioral plan where you get demerits anytime you punch anybody, okay? You can do that. That might work. Similarly, I might uh, look at my older son and say, you know, teasing isn't okay. Let's create a behavioral plan for you that that gets at teasing. Similarly for me, it's sort of like, well, maybe I need to do some de-stressing, you know, exercises to to figure out how to deal with my stress, or maybe I should never have um, a glass of alcohol ever. You know, similarly, we could critique my wife and say like, wow, you're really not paying attention to the family. How could you yada, yada, yada. All right. However, I'll put forward management, while there's certain places where it works, the question is, is, manage what exactly? You know, like, even though, you know, my youngest son had a part to play, he's sort of the canary in the coal mine. What exactly would we do if we just siloed him and just treated what he's going on and not what's going on for the entire family? You know, the other question is manage who? Why are we picking on him? Why don't we pick up, pick on them or pick on me or pick on my wife? And the real question is, does it really solve the underlying problem? So the, my youngest son did punch somebody, but he punched somebody after doing the right thing, trying to get help and not getting help for it and getting sort of stuck. And I might even say developmentally where his brain function is at, he actually did the best he could. So to critique someone who's doing the best they can and sort of tell them they're terrible and doing something wrong isn't exactly the right thing to do either, is it? And often this management process leads to scapegoating. So then the question is, is what else could we do? And the other option is something called an open family dialogue. It's sometimes just referred to as open dialogue. And open dialogue is very different in that it doesn't try to solve any problem. What it does instead is it tries to just hear people out. And you just try to empathize with people and you try to work on becoming a family unit. So in this example, an open dialogue approach would be for the family members to sit down and say, hey, what happened? And then the point isn't to lay blame or identify people. Um, It's not to anticipate what someone's going to do like, oh, we're here to bust you know, my youngest son, or we're here to bust my older son, or we're here to bust myself, or we're here to bust my wife. It's not to anticipate anything. It's just to sort of let things happen and understand what's going on. So you don't anticipate what's going on. You don't manage what's going on. The point is, is to keep an open mind. You try not to judge. 
the point isn't here to judge. It's really to empathize with people, and it's not to blame them. It's to take responsibility. So for my younger son, we might recognize that he was in a terrible bind. He tried to do uh, what we had asked him to do, which is sort of to talk to the parents, and he tried it. We let him down. It just really sucked. You know, the other thing is we're not really supposed to take over. You just follow and sort of reflect on what happened. And you don't pathologize. The point here is, is to normalize. So I think one question here is, is does it work? And it really does. So for example, here is a research study that was developed for the school systems, and it's called the 2 by 10 for behavioral, quote, problems. And so what they did is they took kids who were identified as you know, generating behavioral problems at school. And rather than sort of create behavioral plans or have, you know, the teachers do something really rule bound or manage the situation, they said, look, teacher, what we want you to do is just spend two minutes a day, just two minutes a day listening to the kid. And the kid can talk about whatever they want. They don't have to talk about the problem or what happened in the classroom that day or even why it happened or a behavior plan. Let them talk about whatever they want. Anything. They can talk about whatever they want as long as it's school appropriate. Okay? And the point was is for the teacher to just listen, not anticipate, follow, and empathize. And what they found is that listening for two minutes, doing this for two minutes for 10 days led to an 85 in percent improvement of behavioral problems. You can look online and you can see many, many examples where the behavioral quote problem just disappeared. And this is just by listening to the kid for two minutes for 10 days in a row. It unfortunately also speaks to how little this actually happens in classrooms normally. So let's talk about a more extreme example. This is something called open dialogue in Finland, and it's made up of these different districts. And there's one district called Western Lapland here. And what Western Lapland did is in their mental health care system, they tried different techniques. Many were sort of traditional, just like, you know, the United States, you know, approaches. But one area here, Western Lapland, decided to use this open dialogue model with people who actually had psychosis. And they worked with the families of people who were struggling with psychosis. So they had trained providers and they had multi-therapist teams. They really like having at least two therapists for each situation with a family. And the therapists really just use a reflecting process like I just described to facilitate ongoing dialogues. And they basically just talk with the family, talk with each other, have this very open way of listening to what's going on. And they will treat the entire family system and they will treat up to five days a week for five or six years, and they've collected tons of data on this. Oftentimes it's not this intensive, but they can. What you see is pretty amazing. So here's some data from a five-year outcome study with first episode psychosis treated with open dialogue at five years. At five years, 80% had no psychotic symptoms. 85% were in school or full-time work. Two-thirds never took antipsychotic medication. And psychiatric costs in the Western Lapland District dropped by a third during this time period. And they actually had the lowest psychiatric costs of any district in Finland. So basically, using open dialogue, to be really blunt, has a lot of evidence as curing schizophrenia. Now, if open dialogue can cure schizophrenia, think about what it can do for your family. It's pretty incredible. So let's look at this model here. So we have the good enough caretakers. So we have the object caretakers. We have this environment of care. Part of an environment of care and good enough caretakers for children, most children, is that you have some, time, some kind of routine. Now, it doesn't have to be rigid, okay? It's not too rigid. It's not too lax. You know, it's this good enough range here. Um, I just sort of made this up. This sort of mirrors what we're trying to do with our kids. What you do is you basically have this routine and you just hang out and work your way through the routine just like everyone during the day and these things start to happen there's dysregulation 
Now, dysregulation is hard by definition, but with this model, you just sort of expect it to happen. Okay, this is just part of life. This doesn't mean anyone failed. It doesn't mean your family's terrible. It doesn't mean you're a terrible parent, blah, 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 blah. You know, no need to feel bad about it. It's just part of what is normal, okay? And with these dysregulations, totally normal. The job is for the family to work on repair, to learn from experience so we can grow and become stronger and stronger as a family. Now, the question always is to balance managing versus family dialogue because quite frankly, sometimes you do need to manage. You know, there are times where you're just like, dude, you got to get up out of bed. Hey, you know, that's not okay. Like we need to know that, you know, certain rules are in place for good reasons and you do need to just listen to them. The other side of it is, is learning how to incorporate a family dialogue into all of this can be so beneficial in improving outcomes. All right. So I hope this was helpful for you families who had questions about this, this is Surviving Shelter in Place for Families. I hope you learned something about dysregulation and repair, good enough versus perfect parenting, and open dialogue and how it strengthens families. Thank you very much.